Hi folks, welcome to 5.4 video number one. So in 5.4 we're going to talk about integration formulas and the net change theorem. And we're going to go ahead and start with the integration formulas. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to do some uh, examples of integration. And these are, I would say, a little bit harder than the first set of antiderivatives you got in uh, 4.10. Okay, so that's why I'm calling them level two. Uh, we're practicing these rules and hopefully you are becoming more and more confident with these rules. Uh, we want these to be just as quick for us as finding derivative. Okay, so let's start off with example one here. So for example one, we have the integral of the square root of x minus one over the square root of x. Now, what I want to do here first is I want to rewrite this so that I get the powers that are visible. So square root of x is going to turn into x to the 1 half minus 1 over x to the 1 half dx. And if I simplify that even more, I'll have the integral of x to the 1 half minus x to the negative 1 half dx. Okay? So we're going to take this time to go ahead and rewrite rewrite to see the powers, okay? We're going to rewrite these to see the powers. And then once we've rewritten them to see the powers, we can go ahead and use the power rule. So the power rule for integrals, okay, and I'm going to write this up in the corner uh, just so we see it, is this. So power rule for integrals. So the integral of x to the n dx equals 1 over n plus 1 x to the n plus 1 and if there's no bounds, we need that plus C at the end, okay? So we're going to use this and take a look at example number one. Okay, so in example number one, the first term is x to the one half. So it's going to be one over one half plus one, x to the one half plus one. Okay, that takes care of the first term. So this becomes this when you integrate it minus let's set up the next one 1 over negative 1 half plus 1 x to the negative 1 half plus 1 and then because there's no bounds I want to make sure and put that plus c at the end right now so I don't forget now this this became this part, okay? And then we need that plus c back. Okay, now the calculus is done. We just need to clean this up. So what do we get? We get 1 over 3 halves x to the 3 halves minus 1 over 1 half x to the 1 half plus c. And when I clean that up more, I get 2 thirds x to the 3 halves minus 2 x to the 1 half plus c. And if we want to practice converting that back into radicals, we've got 2 thirds the square root of x cubed minus 2 square root of x plus c. Okay? So in preparation for that chapter 5 exam, make sure you practice with these powers that are fractional powers too. Fractional powers, negative powers. Be sure to practice those. Okay, let's take a look at example 2. The integral of dx over 2x. Now sometimes textbooks write the question this way, but this is the same thing as saying the integral of 1 over 2x dx. Okay, so sometimes when there's only one term and the fractions on the bottom, we put the dx on the top, but it means the same thing. Now I'm going to do a little bit more preparation to make it easy to see the power. I'm going to pull the one half out to the front because of the constant multiple rule. I'm left with one over x dx. Okay, 
Now, if I wanted to write this as a power, I'd get 1 half the integral of x to the negative 1 dx, all right? So I want to use this to show us what happens when we use that power rule. So power rule says we have our 1 half in the front. I'm going to have 1 over negative 1 plus 1 x to the negative 1 plus 1 plus c. And that leaves me with 1 half. 1 over 0 x to the 0 plus c. Now, some of you might be thinking, I can't divide by 0, which would be absolutely correct. So this part right here should be a clue to us. All right, this is a clue that we did something wrong. And that's okay. All right, that's okay. So in this case, all right, what I wanted to highlight is this is our one exception from the power rule. So I'm going to go back up to the power rule and write down that one exception. Okay, so this is true, but n cannot equal negative 1. All right, that power cannot equal negative 1. If the power equals negative 1, then it's a natural log x for the antiderivative, okay? That is our one exception. So let's go back and look more closely at our problem. I have this right here, okay? And I'm going to work that out over here. 1 half the integral of 1 over x dx is 1 half natural log of x plus my constant, all right? So the reason why I can't use power rule is because it gives me that zero in the denominator, which is makes it an error. And if I want to find my antiderivative of 1 over x, I need to remember that it came from natural log of x. All right? All right, let's move on to example three here. So I look at this, I see some fractions, and I think, okay, well, we haven't learned a quotient rule, so let me see if I can simplify. So the integral of x over x squared minus 1 over x squared dx. Well, that equals the integral of 1 over x minus 1 over x squared dx which gives us the integral of 1 over x minus x to the negative 2 dx. Now, I didn't change this 1 over x to a power because this is our exception to the power rule. Okay, this is the exception to the power rule and this is going to give me a natural log, all right? So let's go back and see what we have. We have natural log of x, that comes from the first term, minus, we use our power rule on the second part, 1 over negative 2 plus 1, x to the negative 2 plus 1 plus c, okay? So to clarify, whoop. This 1 over x became the natural log after the antiderivative, and x to the negative 2 became this thing after I took the antiderivative. And so when I clean this up, I get natural log x minus negative 1 x to the negative 1 plus c, or I could write natural log x plus 1 over x plus c. And that would be my solution for example number three. Okay, so let's go ahead and tackle two more examples. And these ones are going to be definite integrals, so we practice plugging in our bounds like that fundamental theorem of calculus part two. Okay, so no powers here to worry about rewriting. I just need to think about my trig derivatives. So the integral of cosine, I mean of sine, is negative cosine minus the integral of cosine is sine. 
And instead of the plus C, I draw the vertical line. I put the B at the top and the A at the bottom. And this B is going to go in first, minus this A is going to go on the bottom. So negative cosine pi minus sine pi minus negative cosine 0 minus sine 0. And again, the zeros give you the f of a, right? I plugged in that bottom bound. And then the pi's here, it's the f of b. And then that fundamental theorem of calculus part 2 says we subtract those. So unit circle time. Negative, so let's see, cosine of pi is negative 1, so negative, negative 1, minus sine of pi is 0, minus cosine of 0 is 1, minus sine of 0 is 0, and so I get 1 minus 0 plus 1 minus, plus 0, which gives me 2, all right? So 2 is the area between sine x minus cosine x and the x-axis from 0 to pi. All right, example number 5. So I also do not need a plus c because I've got some bounds here. I've got a top bound of pi over 2 and a bottom bound of 0. So let's take our antiderivative x is to the power of 1, so 1 over 1 plus 1, x to the 1 plus 1, minus the derivative of sine is going to give me negative cosine x. Drop the bar, pi over 2, and 0. Okay. Let's clean this up a little bit before we plug in bounds. 1 half x squared plus cosine x looks a lot better. We're going to plug in pi over 2. We're going to plug in 0. So I will get 1 half pi over 2 squared plus cosine pi over 2 minus 1 half 0 squared plus cosine of 0. And again, the pi over 2 gives me my f of b. And this 0 part gives me f of a. And I subtract them to fulfill that fundamental theorem of calculus part 2. And now it's time to clean this up. So 1 half times pi squared over 4 plus cosine of pi over 2 is 0, minus 0, minus cosine of 0 is 1, because I have to distribute that minus, which gives me pi squared over 8 minus 1, and that represents the area between that curve and the x-axis. Now, just to get maybe a little bit of a better visual, all right, the graph of x sine x, or x minus sine x, from 0 to pi over 2, that graph looks kind of something like this. And pi over 2 is somewhere here, so this area is that big. Okay. And if we also do go back up and put a diagram for example 4, and we graph sine x minus cosine x, all right, that graph looks something like uh, this situation. And pi is somewhere about here. So this area plus this area gives you two. All right, folks, we're going to stop here, come back for part two of the video to talk about the net change theorem. See you there.